Yesterday, we got a glimpse of the Antichrist. Today, we'll see that the Antichrist has a sidekick. He has a close companion who helps him out, who directs the whole world to worship him. In Revelation chapter 13, he is called the second beast. In other places of this book, he is called the false prophet. We are back in Revelation chapter 13, where the first beast in verses 1 through 10 is the Antichrist. The second beast in verses 11 through 18 is the false prophet. Together with the Antichrist and Satan, who empowers both of them, the false prophet is the third member of an unholy trinity. Copycat Satan makes his own trinity. One pastor called the Antichrist and the false prophet the demonic duo. Not the dynamic duo, the demonic duo. These two powerful personalities emerge during the tribulation to try to destroy God's people and defeat God himself. I want to read to you here from Revelation chapter 13 and verses 11 and 12. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. John the Revelator describes this second beast and gives us clues to identifying him when he shows up. First, he comes out of the earth. This might mean that he comes from lowly circumstances, secret and unknown, until he bursts onto the world stage at the right hand of the Antichrist. At the very least, it means that he is a man. He has horns like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. The horns on lambs are small bumps on their heads until they grow into something more substantial. The Antichrist, you'll remember, was pictured as having lots of heads and horns. The false prophet comes in a more sympathetic way. He may be a fantastic and persuasive speaker, but his message is from the dragon. Make no mistake, verse 12 tells us his mission is to force humanity to worship the Antichrist. He has all the authority of the Antichrist because, like him, the false prophet is empowered by Satan. The false prophet is a man who will promote the worship of the Antichrist. He is the right-hand man. He is the prime minister. He is the vice president. He does not act on his own. He does things for the Antichrist. If we compare this unholy trinity to the holy trinity, this false prophet serves the same function as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shines a, a spotlight on Jesus. The Holy Spirit always glorifies the Savior of the world. The Holy Spirit um, brings conviction on the world so that people will trust in Jesus. The Holy Spirit never says, look at me. He always says, look at Jesus. This false prophet doesn't ask to be worshipped. He says, worship him. Worship the Antichrist. Bow down to the beast. He is the minister of propaganda. He puts a happy face on evil. Again, Revelation 13, now in verse 13. And it performed great signs even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The false prophet uses miracles and signs and wonders, even calling down fire from heaven. This makes him more credible to people. The false prophet will perform miracles in order to deceive the world. How is this possible? You'll remember back in the book of Exodus when Moses went before Pharaoh to perform miracles, the Pharaoh's magicians performed many of the same. Just because you see a miracle doesn't mean that God is absolutely in it. Satan is a copycat. He has the power to imitate God with signs and wonders. And we're just given the broad strokes here. Uh, what does this fire from heaven look like? Billy Graham once suggested that this fire from heaven might be a, a bomb dropped on people who oppose him to make a statement, cooperate 
or die. Verse 14 goes on to talk about an idol to the Antichrist, the image of the beast, which will be set up and worshipped. This might remind you of that huge golden image of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3. Anybody who refuses to worship this image will be killed. Verse 15. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Well, this is terrible because the tribulation Christians are going to refuse to worship anyone other than Jesus. So, the false prophet will kill many Christians. This idol will be extraordinary in that it will be able to speak. Whatever the image is, it will have some kind of ability to breathe forth the message of the Antichrist and the false prophet. You know, one uh, preacher suggested that John the Revelator 2,000 years ago received a vision of television, of screens. He saw an image of the beast that could talk. Now, I don't know if that's the case or if we're reading about some kind of new technology, but whatever, whatever it, it is, the penalty for not worshiping the Antichrist will be death. These martyred believers will actually get the better deal. They will have victory and they will stand with Christ. What all those who bow to an image will not realize immediately is that they will have sealed their eternal destiny. Revelation chapter 14 and verse, uh, verses 9 through 11, which come later, says, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Is it better to avoid a sudden death by forfeiting your soul, or is it better to die standing with Christ and then stand with him for eternity? I would rather face the wrath of the Antichrist than the wrath of God. Back to chapter 13 and verse 16. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. There are economic sanctions attached to this mark that will force compliance. Without this mark, it will be impossible to buy or sell. We don't know uh, if this mark is literal or symbolic. I, I tend to favor uh, literal. Uh, but it is clear that the false prophet will mark all those who follow the Antichrist. And there have been a lot of guesses about this over the years. Uh, you might have heard this scripture referred to many times, but never understood it. To fit into this brave new world, people will have to get marked. Uh, some people got real nervous at one point about social security cards and having a number attached to them. Uh, we are all a number now, in this country anyway. Some people got real nervous about credit cards. Now, you have to have one in order to participate in the global economy. And that starts to feel wicked sometimes. Some people even wondered about numbers on license plates. Again, humanity linked to a number. With Apple Pay and Google Pay, it's getting easier and easier to move away from a cashless society which some people have been advocating for years. Many people want to move towards a one-world monetary system. That makes me real nervous. But you know that the technology exists today to make it a reality and to make it happen very quickly. A significant world crisis could be the primary motivator, like um, the rapture. 
and the disappearance of millions of people. There will be a time when the Antichrist and false prophets say, you don't have a choice to participate or not participate. You must be a part of this new, better economy. If you don't, you won't buy or sell. So you won't eat, and you'll die. That is the mark of the beast. And then we come to that last verse of this chapter, and the number of the beast, which you have been hearing about since you first started going to church. 666. The unholy number. And John's explanation is hard to grasp. It is the number of a man. No English translation is especially helpful here. This calls for wisdom, he says, apparently a lot more than we have. There have been some wild interpretations of this number, people taking the numbers of letters in a world leader's name or giving a, a special value to each letter to try to squeeze out a formula to pin this number on somebody, Hitler, Napoleon, or, or Jimmy Carter. I, I should probably stop there you have the Bible. You can see what it says and what it does not say. Should I share my best interpretation with you? For what it's worth, this is just my interpretation. I am always open uh, to correction. I'm always open to learning more and adjusting my views. I do not have it all figured out and especially as it applies to the book of Revelation and the end times. So, at the risk of muddying the waters, I'll tell you what I think right now. Don't throw stones at me if you don't agree. First, I think those three numbers are significant. Just as God is one God in three persons, holy, 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 Satan's counterfeit is also three in one. Six, six, six. Three sixes, an unholy trinity. Okay, what about the number six? Man's number is six. This might be a, more of a description than an identification. When was mankind created? On the sixth day. How many days is a man supposed to work? Six. The number of perfection, on the other hand, is seven. Seven is God's number. The Antichrist is a six and not a seven. He will be a powerful man but just a man. One commentator calls him the completeness of sinful incompleteness. He will be good enough to deceive most, but not good enough to replace Jesus. Now, if my interpretation is anywhere close to accurate, and, and we won't know this side of glory, then it's possible that people will never actually see the number six. Six, six. Even in the Bible there, it said, let the person who has insight calculate the number, meaning we might not see that number in print. But if the church is raptured, and then the world enters into a seven-year tribulation period, and a one-world government is led by a man who promises peace, but then persecutes Christians and eventually directs worship to himself, well then, people don't need to wait to see that number 666. They have enough evidence already to draw the right conclusion. This connects with something that we talked about yesterday. Why did God give us this information? Two reasons. One, so the future church would be prepared and not misled. And two, so that we and every generation would know what antichrists do and how they work. There have been many leaders and governments that have advanced a satanic agenda. Whoever the false prophet turns out to be, the final world deception and the final apostasy will be great and the whole world will be caught up in it. Do we see deceivers today? Do we hear of false teachers today? Are some even on the cover of books sold by Christian retailers? Absolutely. The deceivers and false teachers that we see today are the forerunners of the Antichrist and the false prophet, and we've got to be real careful not to deceive by them. I'm already wary of anybody who advocates a, a moneyless system or a one 
world economy or, or people that want everyone to be microchipped for some reason to get into a, a security system at a, at a business. But worse than that, even more than that, if anyone proclaims something other than the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, they are leading souls away from him. If anyone is bigger than Christ, if anyone does away with sin and hell and the need for repentance, if anyone ignores the Bible, if anyone lives a life that directly contradicts their message, if anyone appeals to the flesh over the spirit, that person is appealing to the naive. I'll close with this. I think my initial exposure, and I've shared this with you before, uh, to the concept of the Antichrist came early in life. In 1972, there was a Christian movie produced called A Thief in the Night. That was two years before I was born. I saw a recording in the children's department when I was in the fourth or fifth grade. What were those teachers thinking? I mean, goodness, that movie scared me to death. Many churches used to have copies, first reel-to-reel, -reel, and then some invested in VHS in the late 70s and early 80s. This was intense for an impressionable fourth grade boy. It was about a, a woman named Patty, played by an actress named Patty. It was set in the near future, when the church is raptured, but Patty is not. She struggles to decide what to do in the face of the tribulation. Her family has disappeared. She has been left behind. And the United Nations sets up an emergency government system called the United Nations Imperium of Total Emergency, UNITE, and declare that those who do not receive the mark of the beast identifying them with UNITE will be arrested. Now, Patty has a lot of exposure to the truth of Christ, but hasn't trusted in him. At the same time, she refuses to take the mark of the beast. So that makes her a strange breed. She's not a Christian, but doesn't take the mark. So Patty is on the run trying to avoid Unite. She gets captured and then escapes. A spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, she is cornered by Unite on a bridge and then falls from the bridge to her death. But wait, it's all a dream. And Patty wakes up relieved. But then the radio announces that millions of people have in fact disappeared, she realizes that her dream is coming true, and so the story begins again. Will she trust in Jesus, or will she take the mark? Let me tell you, that was scary to this fourth grader. The movie was cheaply made, it was very small in scope with no great special effects, and even though it implied that the Unite organization was worldwide, you only ever saw one white van. And if you could get your hands on, on one of the VHS tapes and watch it today, uh, assuming you still have a VHS machine, you'd probably laugh at how poorly the movie holds up. But the premise is biblically based, and I knew that as a fourth grader. Would I trust in Jesus if my life depended on it? I was a Christian by that time, but I didn't want my faith tested at the point of death. These chapters in Revelation, this one in particular, chapter 13, ends with a call for wisdom. What is wisdom? That is the appropriate and timely application of God's truth. We need wisdom. Suffering believers need wisdom. In due time, history will reveal two beasts. God's people will need discernment. God's people need it now. We need wisdom to recognize false teachers. We need God's protection. The time will come, and it probably has already, when the world would rather believe a lie than the truth. They will be quicker to follow a false prophet than the true Savior. Our faith and confidence is in the kingdom of God, a blood-stained cross, an empty tomb. Our hope is not in politics or, or struggling against technology and the systems already in place to usher in a one world leader. Our hope is in a risen Savior.